Okay, hi everybody. I'm Jay. Uh, I'm in Joaquin Rosasco and Delia Millarn's research groups, and I study heterogeneous catalysis, um, specifically electrochemical water splitting. Uh, and today I'm going to give a chalk talk about um, kinetic analysis for the hydrogen evolution reaction and how to determine apparent activation energies from uh, data. Okay, so I want to start in the spirit of a chalk talk, I want to start off with a warm up question. So here's our warm up. So if we have two elementary reactions of A going to be with the rate constant K1, and then another parallel reaction of C going to D with rate constant K2, and then the activation energy of reaction one is greater than the activation energy of greater two. Um, essentially, the question is at high temperatures, um, which reaction will proceed more quickly? One or two? So, uh, I don't know, I think members of my research group uh, will know the answer to this, but I don't know. I think I think if you're in the Mullins lab, you should know the answer to this. No, you know what? Sorry, I didn't put a lot of tension. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Okay, let me see. Okay. Or I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe I don't know, Connor, do you know the answer to this? Yeah, so you're saying so that you're saying this one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, the answer is one. So the um reaction one that has activation energy one, uh, or the greater activation energy will proceed more quickly. And the reason why is um, essentially reactions with higher activation energies are more sensitive to changes in temperature. So if we represent this as a um, Arrhenius plot, might have to switch markers here. I'm just gonna do that now. Um, so if we look at this as an Arrhenius plot with you know the natural log of K and then one over temperature, and then we have you know some k is equal to a exponential of the activation energy over R T. Um, essentially, then we know that the slope of these lines corresponds to the activation energy. So, you know, the higher activation energy. Um, is, is the one that is the higher slope. And we know that as we move towards the origin on this, this is characteristic of higher temperatures. So as a result, we see, and then K is proportional to the rate of the reaction. So we see that at higher temperatures, you know, the steeper activation energy line uh, will proceed faster. So that's why it's a little bit counterintuitive because we always think like, you know, rates of reactions are proportional to the size of the activation barrier. So we, you know, typically our chemical in intuition tells us that um, uh, faster reactions are with lower activation energies, but in this case, that's not the case if there's a temperature sensitivity to it. So that's gonna be um, the theme of this talk is apparent activation energies and determining activation barriers from uh, electrochemical data. I'll erase this and then also switch markers. I'm going to switch back to the first marker better. Uh, that's purple one. Okay. okay, so um, I guess some important terms that uh, this one is totally bad. Sorry. What? Okay. Uh, nice. Okay, finally. Uh, so some important terms that I want to define is, uh, first of all, it's just the action mechanism. Uh, 
And this is pretty much just like a series of elementary steps. that add to an overall reaction. Uh, and then we have um, another term I'm going to use is uh, reactive intermediate. Uh, and this is essentially um, a species that appears in elementary steps. but not the overall reaction. And then some terms that are gonna pop up in the um, equations that I write is this uh, beta term sub i, which essentially is the um, fractional coverage on a catalytic surface that's occupied by some species i. So if we think of you know a surface that we're driving a reaction on, and if we want to kind of split it up into what looks like a checkerboard, the fractional coverage of species I would be sites that are occupied by I. So for example, in this checkerboard, there are 12 sites, and two of these sites are occupied by reactive intermediate I. So, um, you know, two out of 12, that's like, so base five would be like one sixth. That is some fast maths. Okay, and then the last one is, um, it's sigma sub i, and this is a uh, it's a stoichiometry number. Uh, and pretty much what this is is um, it's uh, analogous to like balancing a chemical reaction from Gen Chem, where if you have a multi-step chemical reaction, certain steps might have to occur more than once in order to drive like a complete reaction turnover. Um, and this is just like a mathematical term that is for writing a, a balanced chemical reaction. Okay, um, some other stuff is the, uh, it's the uh, pseudo steady state approximation when writing, yes. So, so the theta is like the active surface area of the guy. Is that, is that what yeah, uh, exactly. Or it's the fractional coverage of species I. So theta sub I, it's a value that ranges from zero to one, zero. where one being um, a surface that is completely saturated with species I, and then zero being the surface is completely bare. and it's all unoccupied vacant sites that are ready for something to absorb to it. Um, so next we're gonna do, uh, there's the uh, pseudo steady state approximation. The marker has died. Let's go back to black. Like the black one, it's a lot more the best from the beginning. Yeah. So we have the um, pseudo steady, state approximation uh, or PSSA. Uh, and essentially this tells us it's there's no accumulation of reactive intermediates. So mathematically that would be that the fractional coverage of some reactive intermediate I as a as a as a derivative of t essentially is zero. So this value is a constant. This value is either constant or it's zero, but regardless, over the course of a reaction, it's not changing. Um, and then the last one is uh, the last term is um, quasi equilibrated, where basically, um, essentially, if one step in a reaction mechanism is much slower. Um, you can describe the faster steps as being uh, quasi-equilibrated and the slow steps as being the rate determined step. So for example, uh, if we have like the rate, uh, the forward rate of one reaction explain the reverse rate of the reaction. So essentially um, certain mechanistic steps will just occur back and forth at um, or at approximately equal rates. Um, and then we can uh, represent these assumptions uh, visually with what is called arrow diagrams. So if we have, you know, uh, essentially some reaction that is starting from here, it's going forward at some rate one, we can represent the quasi-equilibrated 
um, assumption as the relative size of the or the size of the arrow in the forward direction equaling the size of the arrow in the reverse direction. Um, another way of showing this is, um, and then for a irreversible reaction, we can just have it as a single forward arrow. So this is irreversible. And then um, another quasi equilibrium assumption is pretty much like essentially this one, even though the size of the arrows is not um, the same, uh, essentially we can say that uh, this is like an approximation. So the, um, you know, the, re the, the size of the forward versus reverse reaction, um, you know, it's this, uh, I guess, case one is not necessarily always what reality is like. And it, this is like an assumption that it's like, you know, you, know, you can check later on that it's a good assumption. And then the um, important component about this is that uh, all of these steps uh, add to essentially like one sort of like forward reaction step or one reaction turnover, which um, is uh, satisfies the pseudo steady state approximation of like, you know, not accumulating reactive intermediates. Okay, cool. Um, so the next thing we're going to discuss is a um, microkinetic modeling example of just like a, um, I guess, not a real reaction mechanism, but for the sake of an example, it works out pretty well. Um, so step one, we have uh, some diatomic species, A2, um, absorbing to two surface sites on a, sur on a reactive surface, and it absorbs dissociatively to get two A star sites. Um, step two is B coming in, absorbing to a surface, uh, and then we have the absorbed species A and B coming together. Uh, and then making a B star plus a, a vacant site. And then finally we have um, a B desorbing. So we're, we can assume, so we're going to assume that essentially the surface reaction is the rate determining step and then as a result from what we discussed previously we'll assume that all of the other steps are quasi equilibrated so um when writing the net reaction rate we just uh you know the overall reaction rate can only proceed at the rate of the rate determining step so r is equal to r3 which then we can describe as uh the forward rate constant K3 times the coverage of species A times the coverage of species B, and then minus K negative three, A, B, and then vegan sites. So um, what we need to do when writing these reaction mechanisms is um, remember how uh, reactive intermediates or a star and B star that are absorbed to the catalyst surface, those are reactive intermediates, meaning that they can't <laughs> exist in our final rate expression. So we have to algebraically solve for them and write a rate expression in terms of either reactants or products, because those are, you know, if we were to do this experimentally, those are quantities that we could measure experimentally by, you know, potentially measuring the, how the partial pressure of gaseous species A decreases over the course of a reaction or how for example, the partial pressure of species A, B increases over the course of a reaction. So um, I'll, for, I guess, the, um, so the way that you write, uh, so by assuming that all the other steps are quasi-equilibrated, um, essentially we have, right, K1 and then the partial pressure of A2 um, times theta star squared is equal to K negative one, times theta a squared. So from this, uh, we can solve algebraically for theta a as equaling uh, k 
K is one to the one half, B A two to the one half, beta star. And then similarly doing um, the same type of math for steps two and four, we can solve for uh, beta B as equaling K two, E B times theta star, and then beta A B as equaling K four negative one P A B theta star. So um, the last thing that we need to do here is um, we still have, uh, so we, you know, we could substitute these into our rate expression, but um, uh, theta sub star, which denotes available active sites on a catalyst, um, that's still considered a reactive intermediate. So we have to then solve for that by using a site balance, which the site balance equation, um, pretty much tells us that, um, so, you know, as uh, Anthony asked, um, the value of theta goes from zero to one. So essentially the total number of sites, which is just, which is equal to one, that equals and it's the sum of all of the possible fractional coverages. So one is equal to theta A, theta B, plus theta AB, plus theta star. And then we can plug in our previous expressions for each of these that we derive from the quasi-equilibrium approximation, and then finally substitute in um, a theta star value is equaling one divided by one plus K one, the one half, B A two to the one half, plus K2 B plus K4 negative one P A B. Okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna move over to this board now. Um, so eventually what you can do is um, you can substitute all of these terms that we um, that we derived into our original rate expression up here and then solve for all of the reactive intermediates um, and express them in terms of known measurable quantities. And I'm going to skip a few mathematical steps, but if you, um, there's a form that you can algebraically uh, write it as, I'm going to have to switch markers again. That was a, not as difficult to read. Okay. I think it looks fun. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Ooh, wow. This one is surprisingly pretty good. So um, eventually, if you do some algebraic steps, you can get it as R is equal to uh, K3 and then K1 to the one half A2, B, B2, the one half BB. And then one minus uh, a one to negative one half, a two to negative one, a three to negative one, and then a four to negative one, and then a partial product of a b, b a two to the one half, b b. Uh, theta star squared. So um, the special thing about this form of the equation is um, this term here, this one minus term, uh, you can write it as it's this thing known as uh, you pretty much, I've grouped together all these terms and you can write that as gamma, which is actually called, um, uh, it's known as an uh, approach to equilibrium, which is yet another value that fluctuates between zero and one. And that pretty much tells us the, um, like over the course of the reaction, how close you are to the reaction equilibrating. So for example, gamma equals zero at 
low partial pressures in this case of species AB because the reaction is like over the course of the reaction, it's like very early on. So you're far from equilibrium. But then as you let this reaction go, you know, to infinity and approach equilibrium, this term will um, become one. And then, you know, as we, as we know from like physical chemistry, once your reaction is equilibrated and once you're at equilibrium, you no longer observe a net rate of reaction. So if gamma equals one, essentially, you know, the rate of reaction goes to zero. Um, so I guess let me write the last, uh, the last line of this. So, so essentially R is equal to A3, a1 to the one half, e2, e a2 to the one half, b, e, and then one minus gamma and theta star squared. Um, I could have substituted this in for theta star, but I, I didn't want to. The, the the point that I was trying to make was this approach to equilibrium value. So um, the next thing we're gonna do is um we're going to consider the case of uh low low fractional conversion or um essentially the case where um where pab is approximately zero so we've barely formed any products and so as a result our approach to the equilibrium is approximately zero so then that simplifies this equation a little bit further um as just K3 and then K1, so the one half, K2, E, A2 is the one half, E, V, and then beta star squared. So um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to determine the um, apparent activation barriers using the, um, I think it's the at least I think it's the Van Hoff equation, but so I'm going to switch over to the, back to this for now. Um, let's see. I'm going to keep that up, but I can erase all of this, I think. Okay, so the key, the key equations that we're going to use for this is... Uh, Essentially, the activation energy says each double dagger is equal to RT squared D L N K T. And then the enthalpy of reaction is equal to RT squared D L N and then capital K, which is our equilibrium constants, uh, DT. Uh, so what we're going to do is um, I'm going to go back over to this board and I'm going to multiply both sides of this equation um, times RT squared and then take the temperature derivative of the natural log of the reaction rate. So I'm going to write this as uh, RT squared DLN R T and this is equal to RT squared uh, DLN K3 DT plus DLN of K1 to one half DT plus DLN of K2 DT. And then um, plus DLN of uh, beta star squared um, And then you might wonder like what happened to the partial pressures here though those are terms that just went that went to zero. Um, so using these relationships from over here, essentially what we can do is um, we could say that this equals um, uh, H3 double dagger plus 0 0.5 delta H1 plus delta H2 
um, plus RT squared D ln of theta star squared T. And then if we were to solve for this quantity using um, the relationship that we derived earlier, eventually we get as um, a final answer as, uh, so our apparent activation barrier is going to be equal to um, the activation energy of the rate determining step and then plus a bunch of absorption energies. Actually, I'm going to give myself a little bit more room. This is a, there's a few terms here. So eventually, you got to go final answer. The apparent activation energy is equal to H3 double dagger plus 0 0.5 delta H1 plus delta H2. And then minus delta H1 theta A minus 2 delta H2 theta B, and then minus uh, 2 delta H4 theta A. Um, so we can group these into essentially this equation into three different parts. So um, part one here, which is the H3 double dagger, that, that represents kind of like this true activation barrier of you know, the rate determining step of this reaction mechanism. However, um, part two here, which is the delta H1 and delta H2, that's the um, formation enthalpy of the uh, reactive intermediates that are involved in the rate determining step. So if we think of the absorption enthalpy of step one, that's sticking gaseous species A onto the surface. And then delta H2 <clears throat> refers to sticking gaseous species B onto the surface. And then um, step three here, that refers to essentially the desorption enthalpy of intermediates that's scaled by the number of sites and the rate determining step. And you can think of that as a like energetic penalty of freeing a site for the reaction to occur once again. So I think this, this is the main conclusion of this type of analysis that I think is pretty fascinating is um, this kind of show, you know, like we understand from our chemical intuition that catalysts speed up the rate of chemical reactions, but this mathematically shows us how that occurs. And that's essentially the apparent activation barrier is what we are able, that's a quantity that we're able to measure. And um, we see that the true activation barrier is lowered by the enthalpy of putting species onto a heterogeneous catalysis or catalytic surface. So um, I'm gonna move over this floor real quick. And I guess the last thing I'll show is, um, I'll just show this. Uh, visually by drawing it as a reaction coordinate diagram, which essentially means so if we have um, energy and then reaction coordinate, So we have uh, reactants A2 and I guess B over here, and then final products AB over here. So um, this is our true activation barrier H3 double dagger, but the apparent activation barrier that we measure is this one here. Uh, and then the, um, Adsorption enthalpy that lowers the true activation barrier to the apparent activation barrier is here, and then the desorption penalty is here. So, um, I guess, does anyone have any questions before we move on to actual electrochemistry?
Yeah. yeah. This is not exactly like this. So I was, I was a little bit, um, I would like to put a clarification on uh, the four pages of the uh, four reaction field there. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, the expression um, 3K value, one of the small K, one of the big K. I want to know why you separated that in different um, size K. K yeah, K sure. They're all, they're all representing a reaction. Sure. So um, the lowercase K value, that refers, that's a, um, that's a that's a kinetic value, so that refers to the um, rate constant. So that is the like a, essentially a that's a number that's a proportionality factor that describes the rate of a chemical reaction. So that's like you know how quickly you're evolving species is a function of time. The uppercase k value that refers to an equilibrium constant, and that's a thermodynamic quantity, which um, essentially a uppercase k value is actually the ratio between the lowercase k values of the forward and reverse reaction. And in other words, what the uppercase k value can tell us, like the number associated with this, that tells us, um, you know, once you approach equilibrium and been doing this reaction forever, um, the size of this value tells us that whether um, it is thermodynamically favorable to form products versus reactants, but it doesn't tell us anything about the rates of reactions. So the idea behind um, in the quasi equilibrated assumptions that we made for uh, steps one, two, and four is we're saying that these reactions are equilibrated, meaning that we can assume that the um, uh, forward and reverse rates are approximately equal and that the overall rate of the reaction will be dictated by, um, will be dictated by uh, step three, you know, multiplied by other values, but that's why we use the lowercase k for that is because that's the rate determining step. So that's like of a multi-step reaction sequence, uh, step three is what's ultimately driving the progress of the overall reaction. So k1 and k2 are the ratios of the first two steps, the third and fourth step? Um, capital k1 and capital k2 are the ratios of the forward and reverse reactions for each elementary step. Okay. I was wondering why there's like two capital k instead of four, but you need four. Okay, um, no, I think uh, in the final expression, there, I think there is, I, I don't know, let me check if there's a, yeah, there is a K4 value. So I used um, in the approach to equilibrium, uh, essentially the approach to equilibrium uh, value, that is a, that's like grouping together a bunch of the capital K values. So that includes K1, K2, and K4. And those are all grouped together. And that kind of tells us like, Overall, how close are we to the overall reaction being equilibrated? So, how does it link, uh, link to guess, the, this theory and the analysis to a practical and application of a catalyst and analysis? Of yeah, so I'll, I'll get to that next, actually. That's good. And so, it's a, good a, a, a in, this, in this equation is typically is right in the characters, right? Uh, no, this, this is just like a, like a toy reaction. That's just like, so it's, it's for the sake of the, it's like, it, Pretty much like the reason why I selected this reaction mechanism is it does a good job demonstrating um, how we lower activation barriers by absorbing things to the surface. And does it typically proceed one through four, or can it go four to one? Um, I think I think the idea behind that it's not necessarily like this step has to occur chronologically before this step. It's more so that. Um, you like for example you're gonna have gaseous species a2 and b and then you're going to observe a partial pressure of your product a b increasing over time and i wouldn't necessarily say that from one elementary step to the next you're gonna have to like wait for it to occur but it's more so that these all these steps all have to occur together or like all four of these steps have to occur together in order for like the Catalytic site to like turn over the reaction. So it's like, think of it as like all four of these steps happen together in sequence and then, um, and then they go like once again. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. I mean, you were assuming that K2 or four is equivalent. So this mechanism is equivalent to the time of the that's equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, I wrote one second. Uh, I, yeah, so um, I wrote the rate determining step as, yeah, I, st I still wrote it as a reversal reaction, but the um, net rate of the reaction is dictated by like the net rate of three. 
of step three. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's right. Well, okay. Can you just remind us where, where does the where does those two equations for h double dagger and double h come from? Yeah, I, 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 this was actually I was like a little. I think this is the I think it's the Van Hoff equation, but. But I think I, I know like this one definitely is explicitly. This one is like you just kind of like switch your, you know, enthalpy of reaction with like your um, activation energy and then capital K of lowercase k and you and that that that's like a little bit less like mathematically rigorous. I, I believe this is like from Van Hoff, but I'm like I'm like 60% sure on that. I think it is. It is? Yeah, it's because the equilibrium constant dependence on the temperature. That's okay. Not the only change is that you are you know, solving the equation there. Okay, cool. The chemists in the room agree. Yeah. I was asking, I'm just wondering what the relationships were down the S and down the G. Like, are they, is there a similar relationship? Oh, sure, yeah. So, yeah, so I guess, um. You do uh, apparent activation energies. It, it treats stuff. It, it looks at the enthalpic um, barrier, and the reason why is because um, tucked away in the Arrhenius equation, the uh, entropic contribution and that just gets tucked into the um, free exponential factor. Yeah. Before you proceed, I just want to you go over how to read this diagram uh, and, and like, define what reaction coordinate. Yeah, sure. So reaction coordinate that means like. You know, if you're to think of this as like a movie, it would be like A2 and B, you know, adsorbing to the surface, reacting, forming the transition state, and then desorbing as AB. Um, so essentially, this step here um, is where you go from to A star to B star. So this is the, um, I guess, the... Uh, formation enthalpy of the reactive intermediates that is involved in the rate determining step. Um, this is H3 double dagger, which represents the true activation barrier that's driven by the rate determining step for this reaction mechanism. And then this here is a, you can think of this as a um, thermodynamic like well that you have to get rid of or get out of to desorb AB from the surface. So the important component about this is um, as I'll show you when I go through the hydrogen evolution reaction, um, uh, you can sort between different catalysts or different catalysts are better at doing different parts of this reaction or of like a reaction. So for example, certain catalysts are better at sticking things onto, but struggle to desorb things. And then there's other catalysts where it's difficult to get the reaction going, but then once the reaction or once you've stuck something onto the surface, it's easy to finish um, the reaction. So, anyways, I'm gonna move on to the uh, hydrogen evolution reaction and then Toffel analysis. Okay. So um, I've studied the, um, in my research, I've studied the hydrogen evolution reaction and um, alkaline solutions. So at solutions of high pH. So we have, um, and the, the thing about this is uh, the steps of the reaction mechanisms are named, which is kind of cool. But so we start off with water and then we, uh, you know, Reduce it once, you transfer one electron, then you absorb hydrogen to the surface, or hydrogen adds to the surface, and then you end up with a hydroxyl in solution. Uh, and then step two, you have the uh, Pyrovsky step. Is it one more step? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, what did you say? Is it a one more step? Yeah, Volmer step, yeah. And then, and then you have the Hierovsky step, which is you have an absorbed hydrogen atom, you react, react it with another water, and then you transfer your next electron to it, and then you evolve off hydrogen. And then third, you can also finish off this reaction with the Toffel step. And this is two absorbed hydrogens that 
react back and forth, and then we get eigen plus two sites. So um, the idea behind this is um, you can, by doing the similar type of microkinetic analysis that I showed you in the previous toy problem, uh, for those who have done electric catalysis research, when you um, one way of looking or that people typically look at experimental data to glean information of rate determining steps is they look at the uh, TOEFL uh, the TOEFL slope, which basically the TOEFL slope uh, is uh, the change in electron potential versus the change in the log of the um, of the current that you measure and pretty much, and it has units of uh, usually millivolts per decade. And what this information tells us is it pretty much tells us like how much additional electromotive driving force do I have to put into this reaction to increase the current density by an order of magnitude. So the idea behind this is uh, better catalysts are characterized by a TOEFL slope being a smaller value, meaning that you have to increase the, elect the electrode potential only by a little bit to get um, an order of magnitude increase in current. And then bad catalysts or slower catalysts are ones that are dictated by um, ones that have a large TOEFL slope. So um, we're gonna go through a similar type of uh, analysis of considering the different cases or considering a few cases of rate determining steps. So um, the first of all is when you have a molar step as your rate determining step, uh, your reaction rate is going to be driven by uh, equation one. So I here is the current that's measured, which um, is analogous to the rate of an electrochemical reaction. And it's going to equal I1 and then K1 and then A sub H2O, which um, is the, so in the previous example, we're using partial pressures. This is, um, these are like liquid phase reactions. So we look at the activity of, uh, of the different species, which is, um, it's it's the same type of idea though as previous when we're using partial pressures, and then the fractional coverage of the vacant sites. So, pretty much when your Volmer step is the rate determining step, you can proceed through a Volmer uh, a Volmer topple reaction mechanism or a Volmer uh, Pyrovsky reaction mechanism. Which pretty much what this tells us is so the Volmer step is absorbed, it's your first um, uh, electron transfer step to absorb your first um, hydrogen atom onto the surface. And then the Volmer Toffel and Volmer Hyrovsky, um, the Hyrovsky step versus the Toffel step, this essentially just tells us different ways that we can finish off this reaction by transferring a second electron. Um, but ultimately, it's to evolve the diatomic hydrogen. So, um, with this type of analysis, essentially what you can do is um, for the uh, Volmer Hyrovsky. Uh, the important thing that you solve for is the um, fraction of vacant sites. And then for the Bulwark and the Bulwark Topple case, um, it looks a little bit different and it's just in Pretty much with that, it, it's just dependent on whether we choose uh, step two or step three as the quasi equilibrated step to solve for um, the fractional coverage of our reactive intermediates. So, when we're talking that is this one. Uh, okay. Um, and then Essentially, the thing that we're looking for here is uh, 
we want to, so the way that we derive the, uh, the topple uh, equation is, so the topple equation, if we um, start with the butler volmer equation, so I is equal to um, I naught, and then we consider the case of the, um, of just like the cathodic region, so um, redu reductive currents, which is um, the case for the hydrogen evolution reaction. Uh, this is equal to the exponential of the um, alpha f over RT, and then your applied potential. And the term that we're interested in solving for is this alpha term here, which essentially is this. Um, symmetry factor of going back and forth between your different uh, free energy surfaces of your um, products versus reactants. And essentially, this the this term here is what gives us the different cardinal values for the Toffel equation. So, Listen. oh, yes. You, mean, you said symmetric factor. You said symmetric factor or transfer equation. Sorry, what was the one that you said? You said symmetric factor, the alpha is symmetric uh -huh. factor. Is this symmetric factor or transfer factor the chains? Okay. I think we are are we talking about are, are we talking about the same thing or I think they are different. Depending on how you characterize it. Okay. Symmetric factor is beta. <laughs> transfer factor is Yeah, it's charge transfer coefficient. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um yeah, so this is your charge transfer coefficient. Um so pretty much how we're going to isolate this equation for the purposes of this analysis is it's very similar to when we we're using the Van Hoff equation, but it's equal to negative RT uh, over F times D LN of I D. And this is similar to the Toffel slope equation where our Toffel slope equation uh, is equal to uh, DE D log I, uh, which is equal to negative 2.3 RT over alpha F. Okay. So um, if we go through the analysis for the uh, first for the Volmer Toffel case, uh, where we pretty much what we want to do is we want to plug in our expressions for I into this equation down here to then um, determine what our charge transfer coefficient is. So if we do that here, we have alpha is equal to negative RT over F, B, e, and then LN of K1 plus ln of the activity of H2O plus ln of theta star. And then, you know, we assume that the activity is one of the activity of liquid water is one, so that goes to zero. Um, and then we derive the two different uh, uh, expressions for the uh, coverage of the um, vacant sites. And pretty much the final solution that you get is for volmer toffel um, reaction mechanism. You get uh, alpha is equal to beta one, or beta one, that's the symmetry factor. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, thanks for that correction. And then for volmer hierovsky you get uh, alpha is equal to beta one, and then importantly, it's the fractional coverage of adsorbed hydrogen, which this is the important piece about this. So if we, um, okay, so I'm gonna go over here now. Um, so if we assume so for the volmer toffel case, so where alpha is equal to beta one, if we assume that beta one is equal to 0 0.5, uh, essentially the corresponding toffel slope will be uh, 118 millivolts per decade. 
And then for the volmer hierosky case, which is alpha is equal to beta one plus sigma sub h, um, the Toffel slope ranges between 118 millivolts per decade to 40 millivolts per decade. Which is pretty interesting here because this is the same type of idea that for high coverages of adsorbed hydrogen, we are lowering the topple slope or we're lowering the um, activation barrier through the formation enthalpy of the reactive intermediates of hydrogen, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then the other thing to consider is now we're going to consider the if we were to consider the case where the Hierovsky step is the rate determining step. So instead of our reactions being limited by the Volmer step of sticking a, a proton onto the surface, if we're instead limited by desorption of final products, which is um, the you know desorb the thermodynamic penalty that you pay from having to desorb products, um, you end up with. Uh, so I guess for higher velocity, can the camera still see me. Okay, yeah. well, thank you. So for higher velocity limited. <laughs> Uh, you get alpha is equal to beta 2 plus 1 minus theta sub h. So here, when we're at low coverage, uh, we're at, when we're at low coverage of hydrogen, we have a topple slope of 40 millivolts per decade. And then when we're at high coverages of hydrogen, we have a topple slope slope of 118 millivolts per decade. So, you know, this this is the opposite of the vulnerable limited reaction, whereas the higher oscillating limited reaction, because we've absorbed um, our reactive intermediates so strongly at high coverages, our catalyst becomes worse. We have to put it in a, di like, you know, uh, almost 100 additional millivolts of electrode driving force to get an additional order of magnitude increase in activity, which is pretty interesting. And then the other thing worth mentioning is if you are you if you're specifically or if you're studying um, the hydrogen evolution reaction in alkaline solutions and you just want to like um, look at what your Toffel slope is purely from your experimental data to determine what the different rate determining steps of your catalyst is. Uh, that is not very straightforward. And the reason why is because the surface coverage of hydrogen um, influences your apparent rate determining step. So for example, if you measure a Toffel slope of say 118 millivolts per decade, you don't necessarily know if your uh, catalyst is Top, uh, as Volmer uh, versus Hierovsky limited, because you could be Volmer limited in low hydrogen coverages or Hierovsky limited in high coverages. So you have to know, like, you know, what is on your surface. Uh, so I guess um, I can transition over to the projector real quick. I think I have to join this. Uh, yeah, you can. Okay. Or you can try using the. Yeah. It's better if you join. Should I join the same call? Yeah, I can yeah, just do that real quick. And you have to enable student sharing. So, yeah, this is uh, the SI from, I guess, uh, this is a paper that I published recently. Um, so, here, what we're looking at is we're looking at um, the hydrogen evolution reaction on copper, silver, and gold catalysts. And I was experimentally looking at the um, topple slopes. And 
pretty much I got experimental topple slopes of over copper, silver, and gold. Um, and, you know, we're in the ballpark of 118 millivolts per decade, which makes sense because these are catalysts that are limited by the Volmer step. Um, and then if I if we look at the iridium, palladium, and platinum, which are catalysts that are limited by the Hyrovsky step of finishing off the reaction, we see that we have a small numerical value for the top of slope at um, low over potentials, but as we increase the over potential, uh, we increase the top of slope here. And the reason why like, it's due to driving a higher fractional coverage of hydrogens. Um, so specifically for this study, I was looking at the role of electrolyte composition and if you know, we were able to experimentally see a uh, systematic change in fossil slope, but that ended up not being the case. Um, and it's for the specific reason of, you know, it's difficult to explicitly measure hydrogen coverage. Cool. So I'm going to go, well, there's one final point that I want to make back on the, on the whiteboard and stop sharing. Okay. So the last thing I want to discuss is um, it's, how I got around this in uh, that study, which is experimentally measuring uh, apparent activation energies. Uh, it's using uh, temperature dependent kinetic rate analysis. So these were electric chemistry or like I, I measured high, uh, electric chemical hydrogen evolution reaction mechanism, uh, but at different temperatures. So I actually like heated up my electrolyte. Um, and the reason I did this is because if we, Consider the butler volmer equation. Um, what I was interested in is I was interested in looking at this exchange current density, which is and then um, exponential of alpha f or rt beta minus exponential uh, integrator one minus alpha f over rt beta. And I was able to um, measure the, experimentally measure the apparent activation energies using a modified Arrhenius equation. Uh, so minus Ea apparent over r, one over T, where essentially by taking um, electric chemical hydrogen evolution uh, experiments at different temperatures, I was able to fit the butler volmer equation to those data, extract the exchange current density, which I then plotted as a function of inverse temperature. And then the slope of that gave us the apparent activation energies. Um, so I can uh, pull that up real quick if I can project there. Mm -hmm. That is here. So this figure here shows that. So what I did is this is the high evolution reaction of a platinum the KOH. Uh, as a function ranging from temperatures from 25 to 50 degrees Celsius. And this dashed yellow region is me fitting the butler volmer equation to it, which I then extracted the exchange current densities and then um, took the slopes here to get the apparent activation energy. And the demonstration that I was trying to show here was that, um, so here we see that uh, the apparent activation barrier is um, if we increase cation size in the electrolyte, that increases the apparent activation barrier over um, uh, platinum, but decreases it over gold. Um, and this was like the schematic of proposing that of essentially saying that um, these cations stabilize um, electric um, uh, reactive intermediates for the high revolution action at the base, which um, is you know beneficial for certain catalysts that where rates are limited by water dissociation, but are detrimental to catalysts that rates are limited by product removal from the surface. So ultimately, uh, the main takeaway from this is that um, you can experimentally measure apparent activation energies 
using temperature dependent electrochemistry and then it's to glean more insight on catalyst performance beyond just doing uh, just like straight TOEFL analysis, um, which I think that was a pretty cool experiment. Um, okay, cool. Anyways, thanks. That's all I have. Are there any questions? We do have a question um, regarding the final analysis. Um, I think it's pretty nice uh, that you can do that, that kind of feeding and, and then getting the current activation energies. I have only just one concern. Um, it, it is known that a lot of metals, like for instance, I saw that you studied copper, um, also gold. Um, when basically when you did this electrode scene in alkaline media, they form spontaneously like oxides, hydroxides. And even if you do the HCR, which are, which is basically applying a negative bias and you're using these oxides, it seems like experimentally you still have oxides on the circuit. So how do you account for that? Yeah, that? yeah, that's a good question. So it's pretty much like experimentally when I did these, um, the the thing that you had to be the most careful of is when leaving those electrodes in your alkaline solution at open circuit potential, because open circuit potential, you are, you know, spontaneously slowly forming oxides on the surface. Yeah. So I would pretty much like start the reductive HCR reaction immediately. And um, I mean, I designed the, ex the experiments uh, to the the window that I ran the experiments in, I designed those in such a way that if you just like pull up the port A diagram for the material and materials project, it was like to the best of my ability within the window that um, it's in the metallic phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, I guess the other thing, you know, worth mentioning on that same topic is um, even though you're forming like a full, a, a maybe like a, tiny skin of metal oxide on the surface. Um, the bulk material, like electronically, is still behaving like a metal. So it's the idea of, um, you know, and that's, and I think that's why like a lot of computational studies are able to get away with um, uh, calculating reaction intermediates on like, you know, a gold 111 surface and assuming that it's a metal. Um, so I think that's like, you know, a reasonably okay assumption as well. Yeah, I think, um, when it comes to surface chemistry, what I find more interesting is the surface pore bay diagram calculation of what are the most abundant adsorbed species, as opposed to what is like the phase that the catalyst is in. I think that I think I think that is more insightful. I'm looking at the role, of like you know, rather than maybe a metal oxide, looking at the role of like a co-adsorbed hydroxide on reaction rates. I think mean, I think that's like more interesting. Okay. Yeah. And we just like on the mass question. So uh we just use we assume the output of being zero point five and I want to know why it is and like you know, also want to understand why we use that gate instead of uh amps. Like I, I guess that gave me ten, right? So every ten amps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So the first question, which is why we assume uh does it have to do with the um deviation from equilibrium, like you said, the two anonic and the value. Currents and then alpha 0.5 assumes like kind of yeah so uh yeah so alpha yeah so that was a mistake so alpha is the charge transfer coefficient okay. beta is the beta. symmetry factor okay. and assuming that that is 0 0.5 that's a reasonably good assumption and that just has to do with um like uh so like I think it's like Mark what is it Marcus theory that I'm looking for? Marcus theory that comes from that it's uh essentially that um the like so-called transition state between going from your products to your reactants, like it's like reversible and that essentially from the perspective of the species that's reacting, the products at that point, the products look equally as similar as the reactants. But the problem with doing that is, I don't know if you saw in my, like the values for the experimental TOEFL slopes that I reported in my paper. So some of those like were beyond like at like 200 millivolts per decade. And that's because, um, assuming that uh, and that comes from the that assumption of it being 0.5 so like it being 0.5 is like not necessarily a very good assumption in my opinion most of the time but people still assume it's 0.5 which is like kind of pretty meh but whatever i think all of TOEFL analysis is kind of meh if you just like are willing to hang your hat on that 
And still the last question is so like your analysis, what uh cows were the most promising and uh what can you do to uh improve them for tractor cows and sure. to make them cheaper? Yeah, I mean the best catalysts for hydrogen evolution is still is platinum and it will always be platinum. Uh but I think the importance of the research that I've done is it's the idea of looking at how a novel catalyst responds to changes in electrolyte composition is a pretty similar or is a pretty simple experiment to glean information on the rate determining steps of this catalyst and how to like, you know, so for example, if you have a catalyst that you're limited by, um, or, or for example, like if you're stuck with using a catalyst that's limited by starting the um, chemical reaction, you would want to use electrolyte containing smaller alkali metal cations. But if you're limited by if you're limited by finishing off the chemical reaction, you would want to use a uh, electrolyte with larger cations. So I think this just like highlights the importance of like a good fundamental understanding of these materials. How do you ascertain that this is the great Yeah. Um, that's based on how the measured rates responds to changes in electrolyte composition. So if HR rates increase with cation size, you're limited by uh, the step. And then if uh, rates decrease with increasing cation size, you're limited by the step. And the details of that are, um, that's like what my paper focuses on. This was just like a small kinetic analysis that I did. Um, yeah. So, but you guys are not in developing new catalysts. You're just trying to understand the mechanism behind the reactions. Um, I'm not developing new catalysts, but other members of my lab okay. do synthesize materials, okay. but also with like a fun, a good fundamental understanding. I think like a lot of catalysis work was just like you kind of made everything, and then you're like, okay, it works. Whereas now it's like we actually have to understand like what the active sites are specifically. Right. What are your future plans for this type of research? Are you going to continue going down this path? Or you can get yeah, so right right now I'm studying uh, cat effects on the oxygen reduction reaction to explain. I'm interested in looking at why um, oxygen reduction occurs faster at, in alkaline pHs compared to acidic pHs, and then also similar, a similar type of size trend on it. And I think what's the most interesting or what the most promising avenue for that is looking at the role of different adsorbed intermediates and how cations drive those towards the surface. Um, and then I'm also interested in how electrolyte composition uh, or like if the, if, or figure, determining experimental techniques to actually like probe the presence of these cations at the surface. Um, I think the work that I've done highlights this like materials gap between like macroscopic activity measurements versus like atomic scale calculations. Um, so that's other stuff I'm interested in. So this this whole research is in the context of electro it's splitting of water, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. But then can can these so can these say these principles can be applied to fuel cells also or yeah so ER and HRA? Oh sure. So um yeah, so I would like to believe that if you have a fuel cell with a platinum catalyst, you would measure faster rates in lithium hydroxide than cesium hydroxide because the same uh, reaction mechanisms are occurring. However, I think there, there are other design challenges with fuel cells beyond just the catalyst. Um, yeah, yes. And then I and then in terms of this like kinetic rate analysis, like I mean, all of this is from uh, like a you know, fundamental uh, like mathematical equations and stuff like that. So you could do this, you can do this type of analysis for any heterogeneous catalysis reaction. I'm not exactly sure like how useful that information would be, but um, yeah, you can do it for anything. All right, cool. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, my arm is tired.